Hey, Bravo 110. The military was everywhere. MPs with M16s watching and listening. We'd have to get frisked in and coming out. Even though the government authorized access to the peak, it became apparent we weren't welcome there. As if the mountain wasn't enough, we were also going up against the military. Do you trust Terry and his financial backers, the volunteers? Do you trust these people to go out there every day and work and not salt the site with a gold bar or an artifact? If you're the US government, you go, well, hell no. The cat was out of the bag partially due to Babe not being able to keep a secret. Mama had a fantastic memory, but she had a fantastic mouth. She talked too much. She would not keep a secret. She'd go and get her best friends and tell them about it and don't tell nobody. Doc was already being hounded by every law enforcement officer in the Southwest. Every time he got his head out, he'd be arrested. What they were trying to do is find him with his scope. And then they could put him in, in the jail, and then they could go out and get it. This was the whole scheme. So he thought, this is dangerous business, and he feared for the life of the kids. He was always afraid that if we knew too much information, that we could be kidnapped and killed. In fact, we did get one kidnap threat. We didn't know what to do. And he was a target. Now Doc had law enforcement, Secret Service, and FBI following him everywhere he went. The poor man was at his wit's end. That's when Doc disappeared. Initially, I put a camera pointing down the upper nose shaft, and it was frightening looking down there. There's nothing. It's just a 20-story drop. I was shooting from up above, and like right at that moment, the rubber eyepiece pops off the camera and bounces down and falls what seems to be forever. So the other teams were exploring in Soldier's Hope and Porter McDonald. And uh, the MPs who were watching over us every day we were out there, they weren't allowed to go in the mountain. So, you know, Gene and I were kind of flying under the radar. From a documentarian point of view, I thought the best way to put myself in Doc's shoes was just to literally follow the path that he took. No one's ever tried to go down the upper NOS shaft since the 50s because it was just far too dangerous. It's like 17 stories, just a sheer drop. But this is the way Doc went to get back in after the collapse. So, of course, we had to see it for ourselves. I was able to see Doc's ladder vertically down, and it looked dangerous. It's a really old ladder. In order to safely proceed into that area, in case the ladders or anything else collapsed, we were going to repel Alex down in the fissure. You boys sure you know what you're doing? <laughs> <laughs> I had never repelled before. I never put a harness on before. But we put all the gear on, and they just lowered me down into almost a 20-story drop. Uh, brave or stupid? Really stupid. Uh, it was pretty spooky to look down at. It went down quite a long ways. It became apparent how frightening it is when 
I put my feet on dirt still wedged in the walls left from the ant farm, and it collapsed beneath me. It rattled, it rumbled, it banged off of the walls. I thought he had probably fallen along with the debris. Can you see it? Can you see it? When I got down there, it was just fascinating to see the history. And then Gene came down there, and we saw mounds of debris from the fallen tunnels. And we walked this debris pile. We discovered a lower NOS shaft. And I looked down the shaft, and, and I'm thinking, there's no way to go down it. Everything that's holding that together was so fragile. We decided to go back to the ladder and follow the original path Doc went after the collapse. We know after the collapse, Doc put the ladder up on the wall, but Gene and I are seeing the ladder disappear down into the dirt. It was clear that if nobody has ever dug it out. And then we're like, well, if there's any chance to pick up Doc's trail, let's go dig vertically down there and see what's going on. Doc was gone about two years. He was out working in Texas to accumulate enough money to go back again. He took on a, a partner there where he was working. A guy by the name of Ryan had a tool company, Ryan Tool Company. And uh, they had made arrangements. They was going to buy 51 bars. And uh, when How they much were they going to pay you for those bars? Well, uh, it came up into close to a half million right then. And Ryan instigated. He goes down to Doc and he said, Doc, Babe has jumped your claim. She's going to steal it all. And all of this, he's trying to cause trouble. He didn't know what to believe about this. So Doc filed a bunch of mining claims over on Geronimo Peak, the next peak over, so they would have a place to observe what was happening over on Victoria Peak. They put a oil rig down. Act like they were drilling for oil. Cover up what they had planned to do. Charlie Ryan had his crew out building an airstrip. Doc had intentions of flying gold out of the country. They built a runway there for the plane. Ryan was going to fly the gold out. Doc was going to get reimbursed for it. And they're just yelling at each other, just letting loose. He said, I see you got it all. You've got the claim all in your name. She said, well, yeah, I've got it in my name, but you'll go up there and check out Santa Fe, and you'll find out that your part is reserved. She said, remember, we formed the Cheyenne Mining Company, and your share of the treasure is right there on paper. Nothing has changed. And he said, babe, did you do that? And she said, well, sure, I did, Doc. And he said, well, they told me that you've got it all and was going to keep it all. Charlie Ryan got caught lying. And as you can hear, the debris is shooting through here and going into the truck, which is a large vacuum truck, which is sitting just outside the entrance here. For about six weeks, we were steadily moving debris out of the fissure. What we've been doing is working this entire area. Uh, our objective and goal is to locate the po uh, this point in the bottom of the fissure where Doc went through. I was working down there. Wait a second. One day, I found this spot. So I, I got underneath the four by 
uh, stock that's that's wedged in between the walls and started digging underneath it. And then I could see this little stub of wood sticking out. And I could see that the board is nailed because it wouldn't come out. And I could see that there's something carved on it. But it had a T and a star carved into it really deeply with a very sharp knife. That's Doc Noss's alias, Tom Star. T-Star, and we're like, wow, we just found a symbol Doc left. So we thought Doc must have known that he might not be there to eventually open the cavern. Otherwise, why leave such a specific personal clue, like a sign pointing this way to the cave, guys? Except there was one thing wrong. If this marker is in fact directional, then we've been going the wrong way for the last year. When Doc discovered the betrayal that was afoot, the clock was ticking loud in his ears and he had to act fast. He had to move the gold bars from a location that they could be found and hide them in various locations across the desert. Doc went and finds Tony Jolly, who was a friend who used to dance with Letha all the time. He said he was supposed to take this gold and sell it and split with me. And he said, I uh, got word that he's going to sell it and keep right on going with the money. And they drove across the desert and picked up bars at different locations and started reburying them. We reburied those bars of gold. So when Doc stashed all those bars there, Charlie Ryan, Doc's partner, already was aware that he had moved the bars. Ryan's men couldn't find the gold. So they come back and they sat here all night long in case he would come from the Rincon way or in case he'd come this way, they'd have him and grab all the gold. They finally give up at about seven in the morning. Between two and three o'clock the next afternoon, Doc came over and they came up here and they were standing. Doc went there on his own to confront Charlie Ryan about him selling him out. Uh, Ryan's two goons or bodyguards had guns pointed at Doc. And Doc was unarmed. And that didn't scare him a bit. He didn't go in there with intent to kill anybody. He went there to beat the out of him. Charlie Ryan pulled out a gun and said, you you're not going nowhere, and forced him into the house. Doc went in the house with him at gunpoint. He held a gun on Doc to tell him that where he'd put the, that gold and dug it up the night before. Uh, he either had to tell her he's going to kill him. And Doc, up quick as a cat, kicks that coffee table right in his face. And these two men were so shocked that they didn't pull the trigger. Doc punched Charlie Ryan in the jaw and sent him halfway through a window. And knocked the gun out of his hand and run out the door to his car. Doc always had a gun in the car. And Doc had a big old gun. Charlie Ryan came out with him with gun in hand. Doc was pointed this way, and this guy was pointed this way. People that were there nearby ran up the street to the intersection. There was two shots. 